time according to them. All right. Uh, conversation, interactions, um, the rest. Some of you may have been out of the room, but there were two questions raised already that I think might be a good starting point. Um, Tim, why don't we do yours first, and then Ben will we'll do yours, and then anything that anyone else uh, wants to contribute. So, Tim, what was your thought there? Yeah, I was just saying that I mean, this makes a lot of sense to me that we have different voices, but a lot of scholars that I've read in the past would try to reconcile the fact that there's very different positions being argued for, and they would put that on Paul as being over the years, he's grown. As a person. He just changed as a person. Yeah. That's why he's got these different arguments and different styles. And so they're trying to as, as a way to you know hold on to the idea that all of these are Pauline. Yeah. Are Pauline. Because that was the main reason that they got into the camp. He, Hebrews too. That's I think the main reason that got in because they snuck into. Uh, yeah, and, and the argument you're making there, which is where an argument that a lot of scholars make, is um, the, the authorship of Paul really, really mattered as part of its the canonization process. So if, if you take that as a uh, as a accurate reflection, then they will say, so the better explanation for this is that Paul changed over time. Uh, maybe he's, and then which direction did he go becomes important. Was he? Right. And that's was he, how he ended up dating yeah, was he in the hierarchical kind of process at the beginning and then realized over time to move toward freedom in Christ? Or did he start out with that whole, it's all freedom, there's freedom in Christ, and then moves toward, but let's make sure that we establish elders and deacons and people that are in power over the others. Which which way did it go uh, sort of becomes important. Um, uh, yeah. I, I will just argue, we don't have any idea what went into the canonization process, first of all. The, the history of the canonization of the Bible is super on its own. Maybe we'll do that in the summer. That would be fun just as a summertime. Let's, let's light the summery. Um, <laughs> there, is it, I mean, like, you mentioned the Constitution, but like the Constitutional Convention and the guys who yeah. contributed to the Constitution, they wrote like books and letters and we have huge yeah. amounts of stuff. But is there that kind of thing? There is. There is all kinds of back history to the councils that were utilized to canonize the Bible and it's not pretty. Once you find out that people who disagreed with many of the arguments, and this isn't just the canonization of the Bible, it's some of the creeds as well, and the decisions of the official theologies in the 300s and 400s and 500s, it was basically, you just don't invite the people. The, the people who disagree with the conclusion are, are moved out of the they're meeting. They're anathema. They're anathema. <laughs> they're called a heretic. They're out. Now we're going to vote again. So who's in favor? All eyes. Everybody says aye. Nays. Nays leave the room. Okay, we're going to get to you. Like, this is... This is and, and this, I'm only being slightly flippant um, uh, in the, the significance of this. There were whole uh, communities of people not even invited to the meetings about the determination of these things because it was clear who they were going to be. This is um, you know, the, the Bernie Sanders uh, lovers among you would, would sort of attach to that, that sensibility <laughs> from the 2016 thing. And, um, so that, that kind of sensibility, right? Like this was a rigged system from the start. There was no, there was no way. It was, they were keeping out the people that were going to have a different opinion. Was there any like concern about those latter books that were attributed to Paul? Like, you know, like, I mean, cause like, like you hear of like Martin Luther or Henry Ford, like when they got old, they started to be wacky and right crazy stuff. Right. Did, so did the people talking about Paul say, well, he was getting a little wacky at this point? Like, yeah. he, he sort of lost it. He kind of lost his, <laughs> lost his mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's, um, it tends to be two camps, generally speaking. The camp that says Paul didn't write it, and so they don't worry about that because they're not trying to explain that. And then the camp that is Paul wrote it, and um, let's just follow, let's, let's sort of stick with it. Like there's not a lot of self critique inside the, the the tradition that would say Paul wrote it about this stuff doesn't fit. It um, it's just really hard to imagine that uh, because of the other issues, not just the content, um, but the writing style and the intention and the tone, and it's just like hey, this just isn't. You know, it's it's like that. I'm gonna be super flippant about. It. It's like the kid that writes the notes. Uh, 
at school to, to be uh, um, excused uh, for their parents, you know, and the principal looks at it as like, okay, that's adorable. <laughs> you wrote this like this is not your parents wouldn't write like this This is not how they would do it like it's it's a dead giveaway you know um so it it if you if you buy the idea that it wasn't paul you just don't try to get paul to say it. i think there's a really interesting um, discussion around who were the kinds of people that were trying to write in paul's name and what were they up to i think that's really interesting what what was going on inside the passing around of letters and, and you might know that there's like this in the Corinthians set there's this reference to a letter that got lost like that would be a great sort of one of these Dan Brown kind of, <laughs> kind of books right he sort of refers to hey it's no problem for me to write this letter to you again I know that other one didn't get to you like what what happened to it and you know where did it go and can you just remake that stuff and was it word for word and what was in that one that wasn't in this one so there's this um internal narrative about the fact that lots of things were written and there were lots of things going on. Uh, I think what's helpful to us in this day, unless you buy the argument that, that when the canonization happened, that changed the game, whether you're a dispensationalist or just one that holds to a high view of the canonization of scriptures, if you don't grant that that period of time changed the scenario about how we should think about this, what you have in the New Testament is... Paul having to make a persuasive argument against other people who are making other arguments. So he would say, I know these people have come down from Jerusalem and they disturbed you in your mind, but I don't want you to be disturbed. Let's take it this way. And Ben, what would you raise? This would be a good point for your question because I think it will dovetail into this. Oh, so my question was just to understand, you know, your conclusion or what you're saying is, uh, do, you, do you feel Paul had some... Uh, maybe superiority is not the right word, but some authority over a regular theologian, yet at the same time, you don't necessarily believe he's infallible? Right, yeah, that's that's sort of how I would say it. I, would, I don't even go as far as infa that Paul wasn't infallible, but I would say I think it's obvious that the early church, at least the communities in you know, Rome and Galatia and, and uh, uh, the areas where he wrote letters, they thought highly of Paul, and they thought his opinion mattered a lot. He carried a lot of influence. He carried a lot of sway. He wasn't, um, like we all do, we all sort of manage the level of um, influence and authority that we grant to people. Authority is always granted to someone, at least in your heart and your spirit. Someone might be able to override you with power, but if, you know, there's that little part of you that says, but I don't buy it. You know? um, they, people thought very highly of Paul and of, of the, the things that he was up to and the things that he was doing. And the early church chose to follow the path of Paul and some of Paul's cohorts. Um, it's interesting and meaningful that the book of Acts marks that the storyline is going to pick up and follow Paul in chapter 7 and 8 of Acts and not follow the rest of the apostles. There's this marked point where the other apostles say we shouldn't be doing the busy work of caring for the orphans and widow or for, for the widows and between their argument about which widows are going to be cared for. Um, and we should dedicate ourselves to, to proclaiming and to teaching and kind of staying at home in Jerusalem. And then it's Stephen and, and Philip who end up going out. Philip meets the person in the chariot, if you know that story, and says, should I be baptized? Stephen ends up being martyred and martyred by the team of Saul who becomes Paul. So Saul oversees the martyrdom of Stephen and then Saul converts and ends up following the path. So it follows the, the, the trajectory, not of the apostles, Peter and the others in Jerusalem. That's not where the book of Acts follows and it's not where most of the writings follow. Instead, it comes from Peter or sorry, from Paul and from Philip and from Stephen. That's its own thing. Like there's a big drama happening where one cast of characters is sort of turned over to the other. And then Paul is like, look, I'm an apostle, but not like the other apostles. I had this apostle from this other experience and I wasn't really there, but my apostleship is still serious. Like people still treat me as an apostle. And for us in our day, we tend to see apostleship as a God, people can tend to see it as a God-ordained uh, positional authority. Paul's argument is, um, 
I carry the burden of an apostle. That's how I'm speaking to you, as one who would be like an apostle. Not with power over you, but with one who says, I'm thinking about this whole movement. That's what I'm up to. So he's on this big journey of trying to stir this up all over the world and find all the people. So he's doing a kind of function of apostleship. And that's where his authority comes from. So he's granted a lot of, um, a lot of input. It's pretty clear to me, from if you read letters like Romans and Corinthians and Galatians and so on, Paul doesn't think, I'm going to write this letter and that'll solve the deal. And this is a clear edict. And the people then will believe thusly. There is nothing in these letters that Paul treats it the way that I've heard some preachers preach it, where they quote a passage from Paul and say, thus saith the Lord. Paul doesn't do that in the letter. He makes all these arguments and tries to make all these points and says, okay, I'm going to try to say to you like this, and maybe I can say to you like this, and when we get there, we can talk about it and make sure that you treat each other well and above everything else, put on love. And like he treats this thing in a totally different way. Uh, that if you only let the text tell you how you're supposed to deal with this, Paul is not nearly as authoritative. I mean, there's some things that he'll say that you can that make you say, like, really? Uh, like, put on the, what, what you've seen in me, put in practice in yourself, and you're like, who, who talks like that? You know, who, who thinks of themselves in such high terms? Um, well, actually, a lot of people, people that you give a lot of greetings to, trainers do that, musicians do that, people that are experts in drywall do that. The thing I taught you to do, do it like this. So Paul's sort of pitching this. And the guy, I mean, I think I'm full of metaphors and similes and um, uh, 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 parables. Paul is unbelievable. It's a little bit like this, and it's kind of like this. And in the middle of it, he just switches whole metaphors all together. It is, in my view, clearly the, art, the, the approach of someone who's using a kind of rhetorical style to convince, not someone who's operating in a position of, um, from my position of authority, I hereby decree. He's not writing as a judge. He's not writing as a lawyer. He's not writing as a king. He's not writing as a leader. He's writing as an apostle who's trying to stir it all up. So I think that's how we're supposed to take it. So to that question of authority, lots of authority, how should we take it? as someone that's, that, again, is trying to convince us. And I think that's a very positive thing. So in this sense, I don't see a huge difference between the Gospels and Paul because they're both trying to uh, make an argument and compel people to, a, a as, as Paul would say it, to a, what, how does he say, a more uh, beautiful way of, no, a, a, a more, a certain way of living. There's a particular phrase. Even so, thought. Yeah, so can I have a follow-up question? Yeah. So maybe one of the biggest things that I struggle with with Paul's writing in Romans is some of created for destruction. Yeah. So would you, where does that fall in the superior to other theologians and infallibility? I mean, do you reject it? What, what are your thoughts on something like that for, from a loving God, you know? So specifically the book of Romans, Paul's project there, what, he, what he's doing and how this thing is laid out and the argument that he's trying to make is really sophisticated. And Paul is using a kind of structure where in chapter one, he does this big setup, but then he knocks down in chapter two. And then he does another setup in chapters three and four, and then he knocks them down in five and six. He's writing in a particular way that if you follow the whole structure of Romans, by the time he's going to get to Romans 10, Romans 12, you're, and he has this big crescendo. So therefore, I compel you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Not as these death sacrifices. Like the whole thing crescendos up into this point. But the kind of argument that he's making, he sets some things up and then knocks them down. And that whole some were made for, for glory and some were made for destruction is all part of the setup that then later he knocks down. It's so he a, he, Paul doesn't believe that? No, he's, no. he's making the argument that this, is what, that this is what the Hebrew faith has argued. Oh. It's the same thing he does in chapter 1 where he, where he does this whole thing about um, uh, those who burn with lust for others and all this kind of condemnation stuff at the beginning. And then you're like, what is he doing? And then he finishes this thing in chapter 2 with, so therefore we should... Both uh, to the Gentiles, they have a they have a view, and to the 
to the Jews, they have a view, and now we're going to offer you a third view. Right. But if you take it as everything Paul is writing here is his point, and he's and you don't understand the argument style he's using, especially in Romans, you can read chapter one, and then you and then you read chapter four, and, and you're like, oh my God, like this is no. And if you don't keep going and see Paul's argument that he also comes to the conclusion, and therefore that's why that's all powerless. Right? His whole crescendo about all that stuff is. And so I've looked inside of me and I've tried to live according to that law, but I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I want to do. And I say to myself, well, is there any hope at all? Well, thank God for Christ Jesus because that's the alternative story to all of this. Not the fulfillment. So he's using a particular argument in Romans specifically that then drives you into that particular, into that particular book. Um, so it, then you realize, okay, what we have here is a, is a, a, a certain kind of a, um, of a communicator who's using varying, in the different letters that he's writing, he's, he's addressing this in different ways. Um, the book of Romans uh, starts out in this really kind of creative way of creating two alternatives and providing a third. And then ends in the super folksy way where he names all the people at the end and says, can't wait to come stay at your house and how's so-and-so doing and everything else, right? Like it's all chummy jump. It's, it's, it's sort of like the acknowledgments at the end of the book, um, which hardly anyone has ever taken those passages and you know made those out to get the same authority that's in chapters one, two, and four. So I think that's what's happening in Romans. So, okay, so all that to say, I mean, it really sounds like I'm sort of an apologist for Paul, right? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> Uh, don't believe him when he says, I feel like Kellyanne Conway, right? Like, don't believe him when he says that. That wasn't what he meant. He didn't mean this, right? Like, I'm a Trump supporter that's trying to explain away all that, all the crazy talk. Um, it just so happens that, yeah, those, um, which is part of the reason why taking a passage and plucking it out and acting as if that can be the formation of ultimate teaching and doctrine is so dangerous. Because that line is most likely a part of a larger idea, and that larger idea might be uh, an idea that's being set aside, or it might be an idea that's being advocated for. Right. I have a question about that. It just seems like um, his letter, the epistles are very contextualized, and they're written for a specific group of people, I guess. My question, even in that, is like, how are we supposed to approach it then? Do we approach it as this is just a book of literary art, or you know, fundamentalists will say, you know, this is truth that we should apply to our lives, whether taken out of context or even within context? Um, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is like, okay, what does what does yeah. all this mean for yeah. how I'm supposed to approach the Bible? Yeah, that's that's the burden that only the the preacher has to take when she wakes up early on a Sunday morning and has to say, how am I going to make this make sense to anybody? So I'm glad <laughs> other people carry that burden too. Uh, I, I've had two opinions on that. If you're asking just my opinion, I, it, it, three, three different approaches in my life. One was um, treated as uh, it's truth, whether it has any meaning to you or not. Um, I try not to do that with the Bible anymore. I now try to do that with articles like from, uh, Scientific America that I post on Facebook. Like I posted one about people figuring out uh, uh, um, uh, quantum gravity, uh, which is super awesome and probably true and probably has nothing to do with any of our lives ever, but it's really true. So trying to set that aside for the Bible because that's really, really useless. The other argument is to say, look, let's just approach this as some kind of literary work and see what we can do there. And that ran dry for me pretty fast. What I have realized is that while Paul is writing in a contextual environment to a group of people 2,000 years ago in another part of the world with a different set of conditions, there's an awful lot of parallels to now. There's an awful lot of the issues that are dealt with in these letters that we're not done with, that seem to be recurring issues in the human experience and societal process. We have moved on some things but there's an awful lot in this that can be powerful. So there's this part where Paul makes this big argument about how in Christ there's no Jew, no Gentile, no slave, no free, no male, nor female. Like the idea that Paul was trying to advocate for a, um, 
non-conforming way of viewing the world by the dominant systems and structures of society that would put you into categories of separation and says that there's an imagination for uh, of life for people that wouldn't be built around that but would be built around being part of the same community with mutuality and understanding for each other like that's pretty good that's still an issue that's happening um it's it's really hard to find the issues that paul is writing to that we feel like actually have got that one taken care of like he doesn't write about polio or something right he's not writing about, he's writing about these conditions that seem to continue to show up like it's it's shocking that all these things he wrote before anyone had ever experienced a zipper yet they are so similar to uh, how we how we live with one another now. So I, I think that there's an approach that could say um, there can be some real help in um, thinking about these issues with a historic voice that can speak into our contemporary circumstance that wants to root the rationale and the meaning and the implication of that in the same place that I do, that I want it to come out of the kind of, of spirituality that you would see in the life of Jesus that I think could have some real things to teach us um, in a modern day context, just as in an ancient day context. That's part of the reason why I find myself such a little evangelist for, um, be sure we separate out which books come from Paul because the things that Timothy does in First and Second Timothy, those books in Titus, uh, I don't think that's what we should do. So I'm, I kind of feel myself like, um, no, that that was not the chosen path that I, that uh, one need uh, that Paul wanted to be on, nor that I want to be on, and maybe a lot of other people don't. And that doesn't mean you're um, there's nothing in holding to this that means you have to hold to that. In fact, it might mean holding to this means you're not holding to that. Um, so even even so, I'm glad that those are in the in the in the text because I think they're less persuasive and less authoritative and, uh, and the like. I, like. I think they're profitable for teaching and for training in correction and righteousness. I just think we shouldn't follow them as the way of teaching. <laughs> Not that we should follow them, right? Which could sound super snarky and uh, sort of dismissive and really picking and choosing. I, 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 I get that. And, and I'm not a full, I'm not full on bought into Paul. I think Paul had some views about uh, uh, the role of, of uh, sexuality that uh, uh, just sort of how he views it, that uh, I, don't know, I don't think that's really the way we should necessarily have to have to view it. I think maybe a more expanded sense. So, so Paul has this sense that like you should either be devoted to the to the faith or don't 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 let yourself run off with all these other concerns and passions. And I'm like I think they could be held together a little more. And but, um, so I, there's some things that aren't uh, that Paul was into that I don't know don't seem to be all that. So I, I don't know. Is that is that what you're thinking at all? Yeah, that's what I was trying to understand your framework for how you approach. Yeah, so. and I don't know that uh, as many people sort of engage with these big issues in a way that say they're making an argument here for something that uh, Paul's making an argument here for something that really does continue to revisit us. It's it's masterful work actually. Like the idea that Paul would write this stuff about how how communities that are forming something new have to navigate with one another. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really pretty good. Uh, sometimes I think he's not all that masterful at all. He's just confusing. And it feels like I'm reading some philosophers that I feel like, really, this is the argument. I don't, I literally don't follow it. I don't think it makes sense, but it's philosophy, you know? And, um, I feel like Paul kind of has that tone sometimes the book of Romans is a bit that way like this could have really used a good solid edit like I think if this had been edited together a little differently so what you end up with if you find people who will explain sort of the arc of of it they'll they'll kind of create the picture of what's happening in the whole book so that you can start to get it up to this crescendo in chapter 12 and then this movement into chapter 13 and a set of greetings and plans to all meet together um, then it kind of works but the fact that you have to kind of storyboard it to, to make it make sense. Um, uh, maybe you could just say, well, in the early language or in the ancient languages, they 
But if you can find your way through the argument, it's, 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 it's brilliant. Yeah, question related to just kind of the why, you know, like speaking with like the, the agenda piece from kind of Erica mentioned. So, just, you know, we've talked a little bit about like the, the what and the who, like who wrote what. I'm just curious, yeah. and I missed last week about the Gospels and things like that. There's obviously a lot of debate about like who said it. I'm, I'm curious your, I guess, your opinion on the why. Just kind of even the whole big picture of what's, what do you think is really going on here, even in terms of, you know, Obviously, a lot of it is centered around Christ, but was that a real thing? Was you know the resurrection, the story, the message, the narrative? And I'm just curious, you know, your take on the whole ten thousand foot view. That doesn't totally derail the conversation. No, it doesn't at all. I think okay. it's the whole point. So uh, the, there's this little hint in, um, I think it's in the Book of Acts that says that the community of Jesus followers were called the Way at the start. And that's a, that's a really interesting frame for how people were talking about this project of Jesus' teaching and a community that were formed of disciples and apostles and those sent into the world. What were they sent into the world to do? Yeah. Right? So Matthew, the book of Matthew has this, this big finish on it where it has what's called the Great Commission, the Great Commissioning, sort of the Great Sending, right? And um, uh, this... This, go into all the world and baptize uh, uh, those. Uh, is it that, uh, anybody remember it? Great Commission. Yeah, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching and everything that and t teaching them the, all that I've taught you, and I'll be with you to the end of the age. And then, so that little bit is really powerful, um, partly because it's pretty clear to some of us that the use of baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit is a little indicator that that was a later add-on. That kind of language, you didn't say that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's like if you're a showrunner for you know, a show set in the 1990s and someone uses a fist bump, you're like, ha-ha, uh -uh. <laughs> gotcha, you were fist bumping in the 90s. Uh, it's, a, it's a giveaway. Well, the use of uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit is something that shows up way later. So it gets brought back in. But what, the, what that shows is that there was this, even later on, they knew that this story was one that was going to all the world and make disciples and teach them and baptize them in this way, to initiate them into a way, teaching them all the things. What they, what they were up to was there was a way of being. There was a way of living. There was a transformative narrative. That's what feels like the book, like the, 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 the scriptures of the of about the Hebrew scriptures, is that it is a call to a particular way. Jewish people will often tell you, you know, the difference between us Jews and Christians is Jews are into orthopraxy, right practice. What should we do? How then should we live? And you Christians are really into ortho or right doxy, orthodoxy, right thinking. We're not really about getting the thinking right. Like we do midrash, all this. but it's so, there's a way of living and being. And the way of living and being is to heal the earth and to heal the world. So in the Jesus agenda, it's much more like this praxis or this practice. How then should you live? Most of Paul's stuff is all about how you live. The Gospels are really about how you live. Therefore, you should. So as John, the Gospel of John puts it, that you'd have life in his name, that you would do these things. And Jesus says, the works that I do, you will do even greater works than these. Um, right. So it's this way of living and being, replicating or letting the the love of Christ that is uh, that is in God be alive in you. That you're you're uh, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that's alive in you. This is this is Paul's big argument, right? The thing that animated Jesus, the animating spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is the same animating force in you. So live that way. So don't be bickering each other and don't have these meals where someone gets excluded and don't be using all this stuff just for your own pleasures and for this kind of base level sort of way like there's there's a more perfect way it was a phrase from there's a more perfect way let's find the more perfect way and and then you know you get into into philippians what, whatever is good whatever is right whatever whatever just do the things do do the whatever things do all those things so i think what paul's agenda is is to 
help people find a way of living and being, which is why the circumcision becomes so important because it's all about exclusion. And it's why this idea of people finding passion and being animated is what matters. Um, that's why for some of us, you, you read these other writings that are attributed to Paul or even other writings in the New Testament, and they feel like they're the opposite of that. They feel like they're squashing all of that, that they that they're, seem to be shutting that down. Now, people who advocate those positions don't feel that they do that, right? Um, but I think that's Paul's big agenda. And if even the book of Romans, if you read the book of Romans as that, if you read the book of Romans, I'm going to do a, a thing. There used to be a, a pastor uh, down the road here that, said um, that all the book of Romans should be read through like Romans 3.23 or something. You know, passage for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And, um, that, that passage, right? I think it was, maybe it was 128 or something. I don't know. He said, you, you read everything through this lens. I think you're supposed to read everything through the lens of Romans 12 uh, uh, verses 1 and 2. Offer your bodies as living sacrifice. He's making this play on words as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is what's holy and pleasing to God. That you live your life, in, that your life becomes an act of worship, not something in a temple, not something in a system, not something in a, in a limited place. That your lived life, and then he ratchets it up later. He's like, your body is the freaking temple of the Spirit of God. Right? That, that whole argument. That if 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 you really need there to be a temple, um, let's have it be you. <laughs> if you really need there to be a sacrifice, let's make it a living one. And if you really need a circumcision, let's make it a circumcision of the heart. Okay, now can we get on living? Because this temple and sacrifice and somebody's body part is marked in the right way and somebody's body part is not, that stuff's killing us. That's death. Let's have a story of life. So I think that's Paul's push, is an animated story of story of life from a very, per, uh, like, um, how people are going to live tomorrow, <laughs> you know, sort, sort of thing. Uh, and I think Paul believed uh, uh, that the story in your head has a lot to do with, the way uh, the rest of your body functions. If you're telling yourself a certain story, that, that manifests a lot. And I think he's, so I don't think he thinks thinking isn't important, but it's in service of a way of living and being. I think that's the big project. And understanding Paul through that lens is really different than understanding it as uh, there are proper teachings and, and we should extract from this so that we make sure people think the right thing. But then I guess I'm making the argument, no, people should think the right things if this is the argument, you know, this is the, that the embodied life is the thing you're supposed to. That's a lot. All right, anybody else, thoughts, comments? So, um, I'm trying, uh, I have four puzzle pieces of me trying to figure out Paul. And this is not something to be resolved by any means. Mm -hmm. But this is just kind of where I left off and sort of the questions I've had. And I don't, I, yeah. So, so the first has to do with, I'm going to try to say this really quickly. Uh, the first has to do with um, uh, Jewish-Christian relations. And um, when Paul is arguing things that, you know, those others who are corrupting the faith, who are, you know, those, those types of arguments, you know, you do this and not this, and you, you're, you're Jewish in this way, but not this way. Okay, so... We have to remember that um, I'm going to frame this in the way Robert Jensen frames it um, to say that there are only two sects of Judaism roughly that survived um, the first century. One is Christianity and one is Phariseeism, which we now know as Judaism. Okay. So when we read those passages, we have to differentiate our differentiation between Christianity and Judaism and their differentiation between Christianity and and that's hermeneutically is very complicated. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think it's a major puzzle piece. And then the second puzzle piece is when Paul is speaking explicitly about social justice issues and uh, critique and empire, and when it really is this sort of um, religious um, sectarian conviction type thing. Because I think, uh, in other words, how do we differentiate those Bible scholars who say Paul is a, is a critic of empire and those Bible scholars who say Paul is a critic of Judaism or a, or a way of doing Judaism or that practice, it, you know. So um, I think I'll say more about that when she's done. Yeah. And then uh, the other puzzle piece is is uh, how we, um, when we say, well, Paul wrote these books mm -hmm. and not these books because Paul would say this and mm -hmm. not say this. We have a, 
an imagining of what Paul is. That's right. And so we might be pretending to be objective and, and say, well, obviously we draw the line here. Um, but we're, we are then forgetting our that we have a vantage point that, that favors certain uh, characters of Paul over others. Okay. And then the other puzzle piece, and I find this exciting, is uh, this notion of expectation in the biblical writers. So um, Paul in uh, Romans 9 through 11 and the author of Revelation, they very well may have a sense of, I don't know how things are going to be, but this is what I'm expecting in my lifetime, and I'm going to attend to that. And, you know, who knows? Yeah. But we assume that the biblical writers had, look, everything's figured out, okay? We know exactly what's going to happen, you know, for all of time or whatever, not just now. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but if you read those um, passages with the mindset that, you know, Paul's just kind of like... Um, Thinking more in the next five years, what do we do without those expectations? You know, and, and the author of Revelation, Revelation as well, this sort of expectation mindset just going forward, the future is open. Um, that that I think is a major puzzle piece in how we interpret some of the more doc doctrinal stuff. That's it. No, thank you, Daniel. I think that's that's super helpful, especially as you start dealing inside the tech, inside the specifics of the text, mm -hmm. which is I think what you're what you're bringing up, right? Yeah. Is that all uh, so what I um, so the opinion, the perspective, the opinion, the uh, what you think the project is that Paul's up to yeah. starts to influence this um, this work in some or this the, the the understanding of those passages is in pretty significant ways. Of course, yeah. right? it's um, was he functioning as a theologian in critique of anything, mm -hmm. or was he a um, an apostle of popularism, of how people are living and trying to help people live out a particular dream and imagination. Yeah. Um, so I would make I, I would put a harder line there between those, yeah. leaning toward that second description sure. than the first. Yeah. Um, that Paul didn't see himself or his writings as going to be in the uh, in the category right. of the of the critiques of the. Of the Roman Empire, or even of the of the, the transitioning Jewish Pharisaical thing, but was he influenced by those conversations? Was was that what was up in his life, and was that the uh, the pressing issues of the day? A absolutely. And if, if one doesn't recognize the, the specifics of that, we, we really even miss the. the I, I hesitate to use more pastoral, the more populist sense that he's trying to help people. Uh, and someone live out a little passion. And someone along those lines, the thing you said about Paul being a persuader, it occurs to me that that is that's a very attractive way to look at his what as you said, his use of metaphors. How he goes from one metaphor to another, yeah. and then he takes a metaphor and turns it into something that it's not supposed to be you know, like you know, trees do this, but they don't really do this. But if they did, it's a great yeah. metaphor, right. and, you know. Yeah. yeah. Only a persuader would look at the Old Testament like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thoughts? Feedback? Questions? Anybody have someone's other voice rolling through their head and like, oh my gosh, you know who would really think this is a bunch of. Trouble. It would be so and so. And what would they say? Is anyone? Does anyone have a little little something to offer? Like if like you'd say, oh, if my pastor uh, heard this, she would say so and so. Or uh, if my grandma heard this, she'd be like, oh, I, I, I think we need to. Well, no, if Paul heard. This. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have a a friend that well friend. Uh, I met him on Twitter. We only corresponded on Twitter. He's been great. So take take it as that. Um, and uh, just thinking about like how I want to frame this uh, comment. Uh, this, this is more of a comment and less of a question in you. Uh, because mm -hmm. I wouldn't dare ever question you. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, uh, he I think is a, a, a MDiv student currently. And he, I one time tweeted something about that I don't hold that Paul 
wrote just essentially what you're saying. He, we're, we're kind of in the same sort of expression of Christianity, and he does. Like, he yeah. thinks that there is compelling evidence that has been presented to him that he holds that Paul actually did write all of the, um, the epistles that ha have been credited to Paul. And, but the thing, what I found f interesting, though, and I think this is what, uh, what, what you have been getting at, is that um, he still doesn't hold that, like, we have this, like, mythos to Paul that we have to hold credible or essentially authoritative. And then whatever was said, even if uh, we do or do not believe that Paul held to all or written all, wrote all these things, that we still hold to him in this sort of authoritative uh -huh. light. Um, and so even though he like holds that Paul wrote all these things, he still doesn't have this position of, well, there's parts that he said that I agree with. And then there's parts that he said that I'm like, yeah, we could do without. So he still holds that. And, and like, I, and there are even people that like hold to this understanding that like Paul wrote some things that, um, and didn't write some things that have, been part of the canon that have been attributed to Paul and still those people still have this sort of authoritative figure to Paul to the things that we do know that Paul wrote and oh, I see what you're saying so someone might say I, yeah. I grant Paul didn't write these three right he did write these six therefore those are inarguable right and those. so they still hold to this like mythos of who Paul is yeah. and that like to me then this is really helpful but the, the issue will always boil down to how much authority do we grant Paul? Yeah, whether and, he wrote it or not. Right. Yeah. And I think that is, that is the, that, that's the conversation that is really important in this conversation. Yeah. And like, this is all really important, but that will, that is what this will always boil down to. Right. Um, regardless if we hold to Paul writing all of these things yeah. or Paul writing only six of these things. The, the granting of Paul to these writings is what will ultimately um, be what, what's um, important. And like I even saw this, like my, my first exegesis that I wrote in college was on 1 Corinthians. And it was about some sort of passage in 1 Corinthians 6 about sexuality. And that was kind of like the first like dissonance I had with Christianity or the Christianity that I'd grown up with. And I remember still like writing that exegesis and even though I was strained very much away from what I grew up with in my conservative evangelical upbringing I still remember writing it in a way that was trying to defend Paul because I still had to hold to this authoritative view of yeah. Paul so I had to defend that and so I like did all this contextual maneuvering that would still allow me to defend Paul because still I had in this framework that Paul was the authority and I mm -hmm. still had to uphold that but once I undermined that, that's where it felt like, all right, that then all bets are off. Yeah. So that that to me is like the the what this will always end up boiling down yeah. to is what authority are we giving Paul, regardless of what we do or do not believe that he wrote. There's this funny thing that people do when they um, that I've experienced as an author and and stuff where people will say in public or on a podcast interviews they'll say, um, hey, I. I I really liked your book, Flipped. Um, not that I agreed with everything in it. And, the, the, and then they go on, right? There's this little caveat. Not that I agreed with everything in it, but I really thought it was super helpful. About it. As if they have to say that, right? Like, of course you didn't agree. I'm not sure anybody, I'm not sure I agree with everything in it. Why, why do, what do you have to separate? Like, what's that all about? That's the sort of thing you're getting at, right? If you could say, uh, hey, I really love Rome. I don't agree with everything in it. I wouldn't, I, I don't think that's how it is. That, the comfortability as an, and I think it's a healthy way to deal with the Bible as an adult to say, no, I, that, I don't, I don't uh, think that's the way it is. And that doesn't have to, it can, but it doesn't have to be, therefore there's nothing in this of any value. But one of the things that the hard push did of making infallibility and inerrancy, these two con new concepts that have been brought to the Bible, is that it kind of said, it's all or nothing. You're all in or you're out. Now, that was a risky bet that, that scholars made, and they lost that bet. More people said, oh, okay, then I'm out. Right? Partly because this is not the kind of text that you do that with. 
I don't know. There might be a there might be there might be a, a user agreement on some uh, email service that you started gets to have that opinion. Uh, you don't get to say I clicked agree, but I don't really with that one part because you're all in. That's just how it goes. That's just not how this thing was designed. This was not written up as some sort of a contractual agreement that you have to buy it all to not. So I'm totally. I remember saying something about 15 years ago, about in an interview with a conversation with someone, and he was of a different perspective and I just said oh I just totally disagree with Paul on that I think it was something maybe out of first or second Timothy um, and now I would just say I just agree, disagree with the author on that and have it not be Paul um, and he was just like oh that it kind of shifted the whole conversation we were having because he's like okay that's another thing like I he thought we were gonna have an argument about what it said oh was this a critique of culture was this a critique of uh, uh, personal life was this a critique of of empire was this a critique of the Roman of the Pharisee system, and then I was like, oh, I, I don't really know. I just don't agree with it at all. It was like, okay, that's <laughs> you don't get to do that. Like that's really that's disqualifying. That's a disqualifying level. His argument would be, and uh, that that group uh, has a particular vantage point that said that says they constantly are letting people in and out based on based on that. Um, I, I have no problem at all about suggesting. I don't know. That's that's fair to disagree with, um, the, partly because the gospel that I see Paul proclaiming and Jesus proclaiming is that the consequence for wrongness, either wrongness in behavior or wrongness in thinking or wrongness in in uh, teaching, is more grace. It's it's greater forgiveness. It's you get pulled in closer. You don't you don't get shoved away. So there is no consequence to this. So this is Jesus' whole view of sin. This is where this is the alternative Jesus is providing as a sin narrative is, oh, I, uh, that the things that you thought were disqualifying in sins, like should cause us to kill the woman and stone her, no, I think it's the thing that caused me to get down on the ground to be on her side. That's a total misunderstanding of being wrong. The, the thing in the Christian gospel story is if you're wrong, as Paul would put it, grace abounds all the more. So, but, so if I disagree with Paul, I mean, it might be to my disadvantage. It might be like, no, seriously, you should agree with him on that, right? It, this is my conversation with Troy the other morning about uh, why I think we have to abolish the Second Amendment. It's like, no, really, I really, really think we should abolish the Second Amendment. It's the only way around this gun thing. We have to redo that thing. It's a total do-over. And what are the consequences if Troy is wrong about that? Ah, I love that guy. You gotta pull him in even closer. We're gonna talk about this again sometime. Right? The, the consequence is he disagrees with me, but I haven't sent him into outer darkness and shunned him away. And there, there's no notion of any sensibility of God or of Paul or of Jesus that those who disagree or are wrong or are sinful or that they're banished. They're brought in all the closer. It, 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 it's almost like it's better to be wrong. <laughs> Because right? you get, because grace abounds all the more. Yeah. So it's such a curious thing to me about what story you're telling. And if you're telling a story is you get this right because there's a lot hanging on this, or you get this right because it's really beneficial. That's that's a that's a different sensibility. That's um, that's a different storyline. And I think it's pretty clear in the Gospels uh, and in Paul's writing that he. Uh, grants it that way. So that's why he's like, go easy on people who don't see it this way. So should sin more so grace may abound? <laughs> I mean, the whole question, he goes, sounding so Lutheran. There, he's, so, uh, well, well, it's always <laughs> like, and, and, and that's a borrow, you know, that's, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a cheesy cover a version that he does of Paul, because Paul's, that's what Paul was accused of. Yeah. So, what are you, so, so what are you saying here, Paul? Like he, when he's doing this whole Roman thing, so what are you saying? That we should just sin even more? So he get, well, no, but kind of. <laughs> right, that's that's sort of his argument, right? And there's this bit in Rome, and I'm really a fan of the Book of Romans, where Paul says, um, "Don't you remember? Don't don't you know that it's God's kindness that leads to repentance? Repentance being a change of heart, change of mind. It's God's kindness that does that. It's not punishment. A punishment narrative doesn't work. Yeah, if that worked, I don't know. It'd be life would be easy. It just." doesn't work you can't punish you know, i mean all of us who self-punish and self-destruct and self-punish 
That's the reason we know punishment doesn't work. Not just because we have these kids or what our parents did. Because our own self-punishment narratives fail miserably. The only thing that changes us is kindness to ourselves, full, full-bodied and full-hearted acceptance of ourselves and of others. That's the activating thing. So this idea, screw this up, you're going to get it wrong, it's just amazing to me. Like, um, so, okay, so you disagree with Paul, you get it wrong, you interpret the Bible wrong, the consequences. And I've heard people say, and, you know, uh, there's some arguments you can make from Paul and Jesus that, no, there's like eternal consequence for this stuff. Seriously, don't fuck this up. And whatever you do, don't call it fucking it up because that's the worst kind of fucking it up of all the things. You can't, like, that's not a deal. You can't, you, you just can't. Don't do that. Exactly what my dad said. Yeah. Yeah. I have eternal consequences if I don't speak the gospel wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if if I if you, uh, I can't help but be really logical about it. 